products. Today we'll be proving why this ecosystem is so unique and diverse. Let's begin. In the Warren Bungles, there are many different types and forms of different rocks. These include igneous rocks such as quartz, basalt and trachyte. We also have sedimentary rocks such as sandstone and conglomerates. All these geological aspects lead to the creation of a diverse landscape. At the Warren Bungles National Park, there would also be small deposits of metamorphic rocks, though this is almost insignificant compared to the amount of sedimentary and igneous rocks in the area. During the early formation of the Warren Bungle mountain range, the area was a dome shape as shown by the picture in grey. This eroded and weathered, leaving only small sections in orange. As most of this dome was sandstone, it erodes quickly. During this time, magma would break the surface, forming igneous rocks like basalt and trachyte. These rocks form from the process known as volcanoism. These igneous rocks and leftover sandstone form the majority of the geographical features in the area. From the eroded sandstone, particles would be deposited in lakes and streams of the Warren Bungles. This would once again return to sandstone after many years, through the deposition and sedimentation of these particles. The Warren Bungles are home to many types of flora and fauna. These include small marsupials, bugs and insects, small birds, reptiles, large birds of prey, large marsupials and introduced goats and pigs. Sadly, on the exhibition, many of the animals were camera shy, so we only got a picture of a kangaroo. Can you see the kangaroo? What about if we zoom in? Can you see the kangaroo now? There he is. Congratulations if you found him. Apart from fauna, there was also lots of flora surrounding the area. This is mainly composed of white box, iron bark, and smaller shrubs and grasses. Sorry about the poor picture quality. This is the Warren Bungle food web. Starting from the left hand side, we have kangaroos, wallabies and wombats. All of these large marsupials dine on small shrubs, plants and even some trees. In this ecosystem, the kangaroos, wallabies and wombats have no natural predators. Next up, we have introduced pigs and goats. These animals also eat small shrubs and trees, and also have no primary predator. As these animals are introduced, they have not adapted to the Australian habitat, which causes major damage to the environment. Now we have bugs and insects. These bugs and insects normally feast on the sugars and pollens of plants. They are then consumed by either the large birds of prey, small marsupials, or small birds. Now we have the small marsupials. These animals feast on leaves, flowers, and grasses of plants, as well as small bugs and insects. These small marsupials are consumed mainly by the large birds of prey. Now we have small birds. These animals eat the nectar from small shrubs, plants, and trees, as well as bugs and insects. These small birds only have one predator, and that is once again the large birds of prey. Finally, last but not least, we have the large birds of prey who are on top of the food chain in the Warren Bungles. They feast on small marsupials, small birds, as well as bugs and insects. 
This food web is not the most accurate of all food webs. All that is there is to give you an idea of who eats who in the Warren Bungle mountain range. In the past 50 years, there have been two major events which have changed the ecosystem of the Warren Bungles. This being the fire of 2013 and the flood of 2013. One major impact from the fire was on the vegetation. This vegetation was very badly damaged, but it slowly grew back over the last couple of years. Sadly, due to the intense heat from the inferno, some plant species like the cypress pine were almost entirely wiped out. On the bright side, this removed all the old vegetation, allowing space for the new vegetation to grow. This also allowed geologists to find hidden caves and rock features. The fire has also affected the animals very negatively. This is because the fire wiped out most of their natural habitat and also their numbers, causing some animals, like the koala, to be completely wiped out from the area. Due to the flooding occurring only days after the fire, there was limited vegetation to absorb and take in the water. This led to increased levels of erosion to the soil. During this period of time, the water quality would have been extremely poor due to the amount of soil suspended in the water, as well as the pollution and rubbish it would have picked up. In the Warren Bungles National Park, there are signs of human impacts almost anywhere you look. For example, on the hike, someone from our group found some litter in the foliage. Even though we couldn't find any more, this still posed the issue of human pollution. If pollution like this continues, the litter will end up in the animal's digestive tracts, causing them to be sick and ill. Another example of human impacts are bridges and paths. These are here to keep us safe and allow access to areas of the park. Though, when implementing these, we are affecting the vegetation growth as well as the runoff which could lead to erosion. A third example of human impacts are buildings and facilities. The more that go up, the more damage we will do through clearing of vegetation and erosion due to the movement of topsoil. With the data I am using, half is first hand, which I record myself, such as videos, flora, some fauna, landscapes and rocks, while the second hand data I used were information from either websites or our Warren Bungle Environmental Education Guide, as well as pictures after the fire and flood of 2013. All the second hand data I used, I attempted to cross reference it with other information I could find. I did this to increase the reliability and validity of my information. Without national parks, places like the Warren Bungles would completely be destroyed by, and eradicated by human advancement. Companies and farming businesses would be all over this land for its valuable resources. Though these parks protect places like this as they are one of a kind, a gift from nature. Here we have Ryan, a keen and young geographer who will be reading equipment such as a lux meter and an inclinometer. Using this, Ryan will tell us some important information about the surrounding environment. Take it away, Ryan. Reach 83% now. As you can see, there's a bit of light rain in the, in the sky. And temperature has risen to 31 degrees Celsius as well. Wind speed's risen to about 5.7. Right at the base at 6.4, 6.8. Yeah, about 6.8 kilometers per hour, which has risen since the last, the last measurement and we're up to 750 meters elevation. As you can see, the gradient's about six degrees upwards, so it's a bit of a steep ascent here. And yeah, <laughs> there. 
as you can see, trachyte, an igneous rock, is the most densely populated rock here at 750 metres. Using information like this, Ryan can create an altitude transect, similar to my one here. He could also create a visual image using this data, and it would look similar to this one here.